and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always, I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. And it is Friday night, you know what that means. <laughs> we return to the Valley of the Judged. You prepping your voice for Monday or something? Maybe. You never know. Probably. <laughs> but. So we've, over the last few weeks, we've tackled some of the spellcasting end of things. This week, we have our first Diplomancer. I suppose this is as good as time as any to talk about how the Bard is the one of those early hybrid classes that managed to get that managed to get out of the suckage pit that the monk and the um and the ranger Wait. are still in. Yep. Okay, the monk a little less so. Er the early monks suck, the more recent monks suck less. That's like comparing and never mind, that comparison's just... Eh. But the big reason... Th the big problem with the... Bar with the Bard as it was... As it was back in the day is... Twofold. One... You can't really do a jack-of-all-trades in a game that's built around defined roles. What you're gonna mm -hmm. end up with in a situation like that is a worst-of-both-world situation. I'd argue that it's tough to do a jack of all trades character when you're when you're um when you're not playing a get when you're not playing a game solo. Yeah, because if you try to make a jack of all trades with a team, you're going to underperform in any place where their specialized class excels. And if you o if you overperform, you're going to be dipping, you're going to be stepping on other people's toes. Yep. This is the reason why the elf in the early days was so infamous. So infamous that we have jokes about where they live. Mm -hmm. When elf was a racial class in the early, d in the early days, um, it was able to be moderately well at both fighting and casting. Making them a little too useful. And the fact that they did the fact that they um that they did that they could utilize a decent set of equipment. Obviously the fight the fighter may have had better equipment, but they had a decent set of equipment and could cast. Yeah. Uh, almost almost as almost as well as a wizard could. Made them made them a little too made them have a best of both worlds scenario. The the um the bard. First off, I think a lot of I think a lot of people back then and even today get way too hung up on the instrument part. And moreover, a class that was built around around knowledge and around performance didn't really have a spot. Yeah. Now, of course, as time went on, the bard became the diplomancer, which eventually led to the eventually led to the horny bard around this around the same time which i don't know when that started it just happened some I people seem... might blame a bard's tale for that but i'm not entirely 100% comfortable with just putting it all on one thing i recall it becoming like an actual all around thing at third that was when the transition to diplomats were really pretty much started, as we understand yeah. it. And to be fair, the the idea of a of a social class of a social of a social butterfly kind of class, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. 
But if you have it be the social class in a, ge in a game that's not really built around social conflict or social interaction in that way, then you end up with a situation where the GM has to put the put set up a campaign around this so that they don't yeah. feel like the odd man out, which nine times out of ten, because bar because bards are supposed to be jack of all trades, they end up feel and and there's and um it's kinda hard to do the whole social stuff with monsters. Yeah. It's a little harder for them to perform at their best. And I know some people say that but th that their spells are mostly support. Um I remember when discussing over uh, when discussing Overwatch's shield meta some time ago, and I had said it's very difficult to convince other people to focus on breaking shields because shields aren't going to be as interesting of a foe to fight against or to shoot against as other players. Even though breaking shields is an important part of the meta. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing here. It's a when you're having people maintain their b maintain buffs or debuffs across the across the party if they're acting in an indirect manner it's a little harder for them to for them to feel like they're contributing that's the reason why we love the 13th age bard so much they have they are able to directly contribute yeah and now the the class the reason I'm bringing the bard in, is in this case is because it's a good analog for the negotiator since the bard has evolved into a diplomancer or a Face man, for those of you who played a lot of Shadowrun. Yeah. Oh. Um, argu arguably, I could compare a rocker boy, but there's not really a good parallel in Cyberpunk. In fact, the problem is there's multiple parallels. Yeah. <clears throat> but the b the determining. F much like how the combat medic we um we ended up get we ended up giving high marks to because it was able to be a medic while also being able to contribute to direct combat that's going to play a factor in how we assess something like the negotiator it's clearly me it's clearly meant to fulfill that face man archetype at least at least so far um we'll we'll loop back to that later on but how it do, how it pulls that off is going to is going to be something to can, to consider. Yeah. However, that be that being said, that being said, this is as good a time as any to get to get started with what we've got. And um, since we're dealing with a negotiator, all all I have to say is, will we come to terms? Oh. Yet another. We've hit him with three now. Yeah, if you're gonna call your if you're going to call your class the negotiator around a bunch of weebs, this is what you ex this is what you should expect. And you should also expect that somewhere in their catchphrase they'll have the word showtime. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it opens with unlike classes that use magic and swords, the negotiator uses words. They prefer to survive by a char charming smile, sharp wit, and convincing words. They are feared diplomats at home both with nobles and common folk. No matter where they go, they get their way. In the end, they may not always be right. All that matter is, they prove the enemy is wrong. <laughs> I'm not right, but neither are you! So, starting proficiencies... For weapons, they have pistols, a son they're proficient in pistols, a sonic saber, and archaic weapons. They're proficient in light armor and an auto translator. Yeah, you gotta be able to talk to everybody in order to convince them. Mm -hmm. 
and leveling HP beyond level 1. It's 1d6 or 3, plus your vitality. Indeed. So, and for starting items, we have a plasma pistol, synthetic light armor, an auto translator, 76 times 1,000 system credits, and a bonus level in speechcraft. I think that's one of the higher starting uh, credits that we've seen. Yeah, which makes makes sense. If they want to grease some palms, they're going to need money. Yep. We can change the world, Dutch, but we need money. <laughs> <laughs> so, at st at, right at the start, we have an exclusive in the form of manipulative negotiations. At creation, choose four tactics to use. You gain an additional two every fifth level. All tactics require a contrast contested speechcraft mentality check, excluding ones that target allies and passive tactics. All non-passive tactics require an action unless otherwise stated. The same target may only be affected by the same active tactic, regardless of origin, once per round. So let's see, let's see what we have for tactics. First is Savage Insult. Insult the target within seven squares of you. It is encouraged when role-playing that you be as cutting as you can. You cannot use the same insult on the same target twice. The same target cannot be successfully affected <coughs> by this ability more than once every three rounds. The GM will decide what happens after hearing the insult. Uh, wait, hold on. It's... It doesn't have an outcome. It depends on how you roleplay. That, okay. That's a very interesting uh, interplay between narrative and, and mechanics here. I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have Not the Face, which is a passive. <laughs> When you are hit by an attack, you may reduce the damage by your charm virtue to a minimum of one. Requires that the character understand you, reduce by twice, redu and at level 10, it's double your charm. Well, it's a good thing that everybody understands you with an auto-translator, right? Mm-hmm. What the face? Next is, hey you, hurry up. Target another ally within eight squares and encourage them to get moving. The encourage is in quotes here. On their next turn, they may move as if sprinting without the negative effects. <laughs> hey, Slowpoke! Get your ass in gear! Mm -hmm. This this class so far is just a, an excuse to insult the GM and your friends. I am, I am here for that. Oh, I know. You both are. Mm-hmm. So next is Pay Attention, which is a passive. Upon a successful observation analysis check, one ally within ten squares of you may be treated as if they had two succeeded in that check. Pay attention to what I'm doing, damn it. This is a communal spot check. <laughs> yes. And would credits change your mind? See? Told you! <laughs> <laughs> you may bribe a non-hostile adversary with credits to prevent combat, get past security, or leave the battle. This only affects sapient beings with four or more mentality. You may instead use this as a reaction in combat to prevent an enemy from hitting you. The required amount is up to the GM with a minimum of 500 credits. <laughs> <laughs> um... I love the fact that they have to be sapient beings with mentality four or more, implying that under uh, mentality four, they aren't sapient. That's um, it's a fun little implication there. Yep, and. <laughs> Next is strong lungs, which you'd, prob you'd probably need. You'd probably need if you're doing speeches. Double the range of your manipulative negotiations tactics. It's a passive. Um, universal understanding. 
When you successfully perform this check, you may speak a non-unique language that your target speaks. The effect lasts for three hours, two hour cooldown. There's a missed opportunity here. And I'm gu I guarantee if I ever use universal understanding as a player, I'm going to use this. That in that all, all I'm going to say is Ba wak re na wit nini bum. Hey, it worked on Eric Idle. It did. Next is heads up. Sacrifice your reaction when another ally within four squares of you is successfully hit by an attack to warn them of the incoming attack. They take half damage from the hit. Three round cooldown. <laughs> See, next is, did I ever tell you about the time? Regale the target with heroic tales of your past exploits. The target <laughs> falls asleep for two rounds <laughs> or until attacked. They cannot be put to sleep again for another six rounds. <laughs> you're, you're so boring, you make them fall asleep for ten seconds. Nope, twenty seconds. <laughs> The next is, don't just stand there. Point to another ally within five squares and encourage them to fight back against the targeted adversary adjacent to them. They gain a free attack on that adversary. Three round cooldown. Don't just stand there! See, next is, best be prepared. You may use your extra action to grant another ally a reroll on their next check. This may be used once every two rounds. That's nice. Mm -hmm. See, next is, let me stop you there. Also known as, I don't think so, Tim. As a reaction, interrupt an adversary's non-spell action. If they have additional actions, they may perform them three-round cooldown. Does this mean that, that you have a potential way to stop someone from attacking once every three rounds? Yes. <laughs> it says non-spell. Mm -hmm. So if they're doing a melee attack, yes. Next is a passive called You'll Get Him Next Time. If another ally within five squares of you fails a non-attack skill check, they'll gain an auto-hit die on their next att attempt of the same check. This only activates every two rounds. A non-attack skill check. Does that mean spells could count? Um, I think so, yeah. I think as long as the spell isn't isn't an attack. Yeah, as long as it doesn't have like uh, our canting attack or or something along that lines. Mm -hmm. And then we have in a battle of wits, you lose. When an adversary rolls contested speechcraft mentality checks against your manipulation uh, manipulation negotiations, I think that I think that's an artifact. Um, they roll with an auto miss. Nice. I mean, I don't... Hold on. Yeah, manipulative, not manipulation negotiations, but yes. So, you start with four. Let's see, six, eight, ten. At 20th level, you'll have 12 tactics. Ink is most of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven... 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Nope. Not close, but not quite. I said most of them, Monk. So, I think that applies. Yeah. Alright, at level 2, you get Allow Me to Help, which is not exclusive. As an extra action, get, give an ally an auto-hit die on their next non-attack check. Three-round cooldown. You also gain Master of Speech, Learn all languages in half the time and instantly learn one non-unique language. And you gain an ex and of course an extra skill point. At third level you gain controlled thoughts. Your mind is an enigma, unable to be read by non-legendary effects or items. You cannot be angered unless you allow yourself to be. Super sensory abilities that affect your mood or intelligence automatically fail. Okay. 
Level 3 and you're already immune to most psychic effects. Mm -hmm. Oh. You also gain Certified Politician. You gain the expertise Galactic Politics and Noble. It's, look, okay, I think we can see what direction this is going. Yep. Oh. And incidentally, all the stuff in level 2 and level 3 is non-exclusive. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of non-exclusive skills early on. Yep. At level 4, you gain advancement training. At level 5, you get your first specialization benefit. The three specializations we have here are Agent, Captain, and Ambassador, which we'll get to later. Uh, levels at, at level 6, you gain the Hard Cell. Choose a weapon with you, with which you are proficient with. This weapon is now the Hard Cell. The Hard Cell uses your Speechcraft skill to attack. That's a pretty good way of making them a little more viable in combat at that point. Mm-hmm. Especially since you're probably dump I'm not going to say you're dumping all of your skill points into Speechcraft, but it's getting a head start. And since it you're going to be using it for your tactics, you're probably going to be putting a few points in it. Yeah. So you also gain Master of Charisma. None can deny your natural charisma. Gain one bonus level in all skills that use charm. Oh, jeez. <laughs> At level 7, you gain advancement training. At level 8, you gain a true haggler, which is not exclusive. Gain the expertise thrifty and an auto-hit die when haggling down prices. Once per short rest, when targeted by an attack, you may perform a contested speechcraft judgment check to convince the to convince that target to attack someone else. Don't hit me! Hit the guy next to me! <laughs> Although notice that it doesn't say that it ha that it has to be another ally. Yes, it just says another target. Just, and just remember, what's more accurate than incoming enemy fire? <laughs> incoming friendly fire. Yep. It's a little bit grim, but yes. <laughs> Don't hit me! Hit that guy! Hits his buddy. A little bit grim. That's <laughs> isn't that like ninety percent of the military jokes we know. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. oh. at, level at level 9, you gain Distracting Speech, which is exclusive. You may use the Charm Virtue when attempting to dodge attacks from creatures that understand your language. <laughs> oh. And you also gain What I Meant to Say. Once every four rounds, if you critically fail a Charm vir Virtue... Skill check. You may fully re-roll that check. That's, uh... That's... That is that point in the story where you say it, where you, your buddy trips over a turn of phrase somebody didn't like, and you go, wait, what I meant to say! <laughs> oh. At 10th level, you gain your next specialization ability. At 11th level, you gain advancement training. At 12th level, you gain a Silver Tongue, which is non-exclusive. You gain an auto-hit die on your Speechcraft checks, and an additional 500 credits when earning them from acquaintances you have successfully helped. Oh, jeez. At 13th <laughs> level, you gain Difficult Negotiations. Add one bonus level to the Intimidation skill, Gain an auto-hit die on this roll if your mentality is higher than theirs. So if you use Intimidation and your mentality is higher, you get an auto-hit die. Nice. One, um, missed opportunities. It should have been called Aggressive Negotiations. <laughs> yes, that is a Star Wars prequels joke. No, I'm not sorry. Oh. At level 14, you gain Advancement Training. At level 15, you gain your next specialization benefit. At level 16, you gain You Can't Hide the Truth. Once per long rest, you may perform a contested charm check against an NPC or adversary. On a success, you learn about their general tells, intentions, and bluffs. 
This check rolls with a plus one auto hit die. Is it wrong that when I was skimming through this, I accidentally read that is you can't handle the truth? Uh, no, I'm I'm pretty sure that's what they were going for. <laughs> you want the truth? You can't handle the truth. Um, at seventeenth, you gain adv you gain advancement training. At eighteenth, you gain overwhelming presence. Your allies within fifteen squares of you roll with an auto hit die and contested checks. All adversaries within 15 squares of you roll with an auto-miss against your contested checks. Fifteen squares, that's quite a bit of distance. That is very far. Mm -hmm. At night, and that's not exclusive as well, so <laughs> that makes it e so. That can make things very interesting with some of the other classes' contested checks. Indeed. Oh. At 19th, you gain piercing words. If the target understands you, attacks add your charm twice to the final damage. Which, which um, fortunately, that's exclusive, obviously, because they're... Few other classes are going to be dumping into charm like it, like these guys are. At twentieth, you gain your final specialization ability. You also gain a pep talk. Once per long rest, you may give a pep talk to all allies that can hear you. On their next two checks, they roll with plus one bonus die and plus one auto hit die. And you gain your ultimate sweet talker. You have total mastery of the speechcraft game. Add a permanent plus one to your charm virtue. This may bring you above nine. Adversaries that can hear you roll with two auto miss dice on contested checks and attacks against you. Gain plus four max determination. And okay, I have to correct myself. A pep talk is a new manipulation tactic that you gain at tw as part of um, Sweet Talker. Oh wow. But. <laughs> Two auto miss die when, when when um. Went with all of your tactics. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I'd say it certainly fits the bill as a capstone. Yes, for sure. For especially for a capstone to, in this case, a more socially balanced class. So th then we get to the then we get to the specializations. So the first one is the agent. Agents are clever and tactful. A silver tongue, charming smile, and false promises hide a dark agenda. Agents take on contracts that grant additional income and bonuses, taking on work as they go. Any good politician or general knows that to win a fight, they need an agent on the inside. So James Bond? I mean, that's what it sounded like to me. I know some people would say Agent 47, but no, not really. I don't think you could ever say anyone is Agent 47, but that's a different story entirely. <laughs> and certainly not Jason Bourne. Nope, not Jason Bourne. And definitely not Jack. <laughs> Absolutely not. He's got to infiltrate the big shell, Monk. Okay. When you said Jack, I when you said Jack, I had to take a step back for a second. Then I realized, oh wait, it's you. So I know which Jack we're dealing with. Because <laughs> I was like, okay, are we are we dealing with Jack the Ripper or are we dealing with Jack Reacher? <laughs> We're dealing with Jack the Ripper. It's time for Jack to let her rip! <sighs> and, anyways. So, you start out with two abil You start out with two abilities. And I'd like to note, so far, the agent is a non-exclusive. So you start mm -hmm. with free agent per hire. Once per day, you will gain a contract. These contracts can be anything from go to this location and eavesdrop on their conversation to assassinate this political target. What these contracts require you to do is up to the GM. 
Upon completing a contract, you gain a minimum of 2,000 credits and a temporary buff that gives you plus one to a non-charm virtue. This buff lasts nine hours, and you may only have one bonus virtue point at a time. You also gain Hidden in Plain Sight. You are a master of blending in. No one would suspect you. You add plus one bonus level to the Covert skill. If you are not acting suspiciously, you roll with plus one bonus die on, the, on Covert checks. Fuck me, nice. this is this is this is the good assassins in in Ass Creed. Yeah, this is. Let's see, at level ten you gain an agent's tool set. You gain access to several devices that you may activate as an extra action once per short rest per item. First is Deceptive Device. When activated, you are treated as being under the conceal oneself spell for up to five hours. Bedazzling device. Throw this device to a square and activate it. Upon activation, the, the device unleashes a deafening blast on an 11 by 11 area field. All beings in it are affected by the blind and deaf conditions for two rounds. So, flashbang. And scanner device. When activated, you are treated as having plus one bonus level in analysis, tracking, and observation for 20 minutes. <laughs> Some really useful stuff. And it actually dances between the different roles they could possibly take, both in and out of combat. Uh. Hang on a second. Okay. In fact, I need to do a little thing. Sorry about that. Multitasking. Multitasking sucks. Ah. Uh, let's see. At level at fifteenth level, you gain leave no trace. When whenever enemies attack attempt to track you or an ally. They do so with minus two bonus die and an auto miss die. <laughs> and make them talk. When you use intimidation or speechcraft to interrogate someone, you may re-roll all ones once per round, even if previously re-rolled. Ooh, nice. And at level 20, you gain a certain set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, real subtle I, there, Trevor. <laughs> I don't know who you are. What I do have is skills, a certain set of skills. Uh. But so that that's how, that's what we're starting with, huh? And you want to know well, you want to know what makes you want to know what would make this make a um make this kind of stealthy build all the more ter all the more terrifying. Mm. Multi-class this with a mechromancer. <laughs> Grab some of their stuff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we we actually forgot to read out the description for a certain set of skills. Yeah. Oh. Add plus one bonus level to five skills of your choice and gain an additional three expertise points. At the start of a session, choose two virtues and gain plus one bonus die on all checks using those virtue. After completing a contract, you now gain a plus one bonus in two non-charm virtues of your choice that last for ten hours. Because we want you to use all the skills, all the skills, all the time. <laughs> If somebody wants to be the skill monkey, there, here you go. Your agent. Go be the secret agent man. Every time I hear that song, I keep miss, I keep um, mishearing it as secret Asian man. I don't know why. Because people sometimes just don't enunciate well enough. That and you and I have a fucked up sense of humor. That too. But next we have the captain. 
Oh, Captain, my Captain. Is his name Morgan? I mean... Or, since we brought up Jax, is his name Jack Sparrow? No. No. So, the captain understands the crew, encouraging the best of the best to serve. A good captain inspires loyalty. A great captain maintains that loyalty even in the darkest moment. I'm reminded of the Bring Me My Red Shirt story. <laughs> kind of feels like that. And then they end up dealing with a bigger fleet, and he goes, Bring me my brown pants. Yep. So you start out with Aura of Courage. Your crew, while within 15 squares of you, cannot be affected by fear. Aura of Leadership. While aboard your ship, the ship adds plus four to its initiative. While not aboard your ship, your crew adds plus two to their initiative while within sight of you. And <laughs> earned loyalty. Whenever you use Speechcraft to defend your crew, you may reroll all ones during a ro during a reroll. Jeez. Now is that wait? You may you may reroll reroll all ones during a reroll. Mm -hmm. Does that imply you're rerolling ones you already rerolled? This might need some clarification, because I'm not entirely sure how to approach this. Yeah. Anyway. Depending on how it's, on how it's worded, it's going to be weirder than we think it is. Oh. At 10th level, you start with Coordinated Strike. Once per combat as an action, target an adversary. All crew members may perform a free attack against that target. <laughs> I'm, as an action, going to target this guy, and everybody else is just going to hit him for free. Mm-hmm. Which, it's a good way. It's a good way to. It's a good way to get some to get some interesting results, especially if especially if you can. This is a good. It's a good way to do coordinated DACA. Mm-hmm. Uh, at fifteenth level, you gain man the battle stations. The crew aboard your vehicles gain additional bonuses based on their position during a ship battle, which. We'll be getting the ship battles later. Pilots add four squares of max movement. Weapons Master can reroll two one results during their first attack each round. Communications Officers grant an auto hit die when scrambling or intimidating. So your e so your ECM officer. Engineer repairs add repairs an additional plus thirty percent HP. And Navigator, Warp slash Jump Rolls and Charting Checks roll with two bonus dice. Oh, wow. And at 20th level, you, get, you gain a good leader. Your crew may reroll one one-result die every three rounds while within three times your charm squares of you or on the same ship you are captain of. You critically hit with one less hit on speechcraft and intimidation checks. All of this is non-exclusive. In fact, all three of the all three of the specializations for the negotiator are non-exclusive. Yeah. And I haven't seen an exclusive skill in any of them yet. Mhm. Mm But last we have the Ambassador. Ambassadors are the voices of a group or nation, powerful allies with useful connections. There are few things Ambassadors cannot obtain, whether items, information, or help. You start off with Voice of a Nation. Choose a group or people to represent, either from our list below or one created with your GM, and gain several credential items based on the group, such as passports and representation papers. While in general societies, you can always find free room and board for you and your crew. You gain a 20% discount on general items and equipment. If you are part of a ship, that ship gains your credentials, giving your crew high-priority landing and passage. You often get a 50% discount refueling your ship. You know where to find your group's embassies and secret locations in town. 
So the list of main groups that they have are any of the core species, Harmonious Coefficient, Nanocorp, Sildra Mechanitus, Warp Light, Blue Scorpions, and the Enigma Consortium. You also gain Diplomatic Immunity. You gain the expertise Galactic Politics and Galactic Law. While in a civilized society, you are granted safe passage and cannot be prosecuted by that nation's laws, though you can still be expelled from the host nation or planet. You also gain, and lastly, for level 5, you gain defensive representation. While outside of a civilized area or on an outlaw planet, you must prepare for the worst. Roll with plus 1 bonus die on all non-attack checks. Inflict 20% pure damage on beings that are aggressive to you first. <laughs> so, if you aggress against me first, I'm dealing plus 20% pure damage. Mm -hmm. Nice. At level 10, you start off with Undeniable Presence. Gain an additional action to perform charm checks, and an additional reaction to use with your Decisive Distraction ability. Which, let's get to that. Decisive Distraction. When an attack hits an ally, you may sacrifice your reaction to turn one, five, or six result into a two. <laughs> which... The, which, um... Does mean does mean that you could that you could it's it's not a whole lot but it could slightly turn the tides to turn a hit into a miss. Mm -hmm. At level fifteen, you gain an envoy's mindset. If you start a session or end a long rest with no determination points, you gain five. If you fail a ment a mentality contested check, you may add an auto hit die to the result. Thus, thus potentially making it not a fail. Indeed. And at level 20, you gain restricted access. Gain access to restricted files or information from any source that recognizes your group. You gain high clearance to places in your organization. And this is the only exclusive skill in any of the specializations. Master of Negotiations. You gain access to all of your manipulative negotiation tactics if you are within an area controlled by your group or faction. Basically, you get to do all of the bad mouthing if you're in a place you're you control. Mm hmm Sounds fair. Hometown advantage after all. Oh yes. Now <clears throat> I'd like to swing this back to what to what we talked about earlier about whether or not the the um di the support guy who we usually see in common diplomancers is as passive at, is as passive here as he's been in other games. Absolutely answer, not. Yeah, the answer is a definitive no. We saw plenty of skills and and uh, uh, um expertises that allowed things like speechcraft checks to fill in for the normal damage type checks you might be doing. Just the fact that you can use speech cra speechcraft for your for as a substitute for attack skills is an, is an, is enough as it is, and mm -hmm. once again once again we're we're seeing another game that get, that gives you a means of um of being able to be on the front lines while still being able to provide support. Yeah. Although some some of the support means I find absolutely hilarious, and it is very clear that the there's a even though there's a lot of leeway in this game, it's very clear that certain builds have a visualization in mind as far as what as far as what they're aiming for. I'd say this is especially the case with the agent. Yeah. It's very clear that the agent is going to be some sort of special operative spy type. Mm -hmm. Hell, if you hell, you could easily reflavor it to be a Django Fett-esque bounty hunter. Or, yeah, 
Django Fett, Bounty Hunter. There's there's a bunch of different things that all fit under that umbrella. Well, I didn't want to use the Bounty Hunter from BattleTech. I'm not sure that not sure that'd work because, well, the Bounty Hunter in BattleTech is still is still a massive enigma. Yeah. Unless you're Clan Jade Falcon, in which ca- in which case the Bounty Hunter is shoot on sight. <laughs> But of course, the, of course, the di- the big disadvantage of that is, well, you're a clanner. Filthy clanners. <laughs> but the I'd say I'd, I'd say the I think the reason why why I like it as presented here is it has all the narrative hooks that I like without the enforced behavior bullshit that you and I hate. Yeah, where it tells you exactly what they're doing. Because it, <clears throat> there is nothing stopping you from ignoring the contract. Now, granted, there is the possibility that the GM could put in a contract that's on the dickish end of thing. That's always a possibility. But it's not like you're forced to go through the contract. Exactly. Hell, a more canny GM might ha- might have it that you can that that there are that there are multiple contracts at the start of a session and you got to pick one. <laughs> pick the best contract for you, the one that fucks you over in way A, way B, way C, or way D. Oh. <laughs> uh, and I think the I think the fact that the contract does can can be something can be something benign or something a little more specific helps as well um if i was giving it if i was giving advice to some to somebody who's who's got an agent in the party and they're the gm as contrived as it may sound i'd advise having contracts that are still going to fit within the adventure that you're doing Mm -hmm. because having everybody stop you Stop the um, na- stop the narrative flow where things are going just to fulfill a contract. Not the best idea. Yeah, I can't see that being a, a well chosen idea either. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to the captain, I do like the captain, but I get the f- but I have the vibe that if you're not messing ar- if your campaign isn't messing around with ship combat. The captain's going to be an odd man out. My name is Commander Shepard, and this is my favorite entry in the captain. <laughs> the ambassador, on the other hand, um, I think I actually the more they think about it, all three specializations for the negotiator, on one level or another, are going to require some degree of um of communication between player and GM to work out how you're going to integrate it. Yeah. Of the three of them, the captain is the one is the least one. But if you're doing a more ter- a um a more terra firma campaign where you're going to be on one planet for most of the time, if somebody wanted to pick captain, I'd probably say uh are you sh- I don't know about that. Yeah. That's not to say that the ship ha- the ship can't be I was going to say that 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 the ship could be a terrestrial ship, but then I looked but then I reminded of the um navigator role. Mhm. And while you probably could house rule it house rule that problem out at the sa- at the same time there is still going to be that odd man out issue. Um, this is the reason why I firmly believe in not just do, not just doing a session zero, but also creating a primer. The okay. I'd, I'd say I'd say the amb- I'd say the ambassador would probably be the easiest one to integrate, simply because it just involves having some faction knowledge, mm-hmm. or just cr- or just creating certain factions, which. 
any G any GM, especially any GM who cut their teeth on World of Darkness, is probably going to be doing already. Lord knows I have. Mm-hmm. But I'd say I'd say what I really what I there were cer there were certain skills that we saw that we saw in this that were definitely on on the on the ridiculousness or or wink or audience winking in the good wake um entries oh uh, i do find i do find it uh, i actually and now that i think about it i know who the who the ideal archetype for the, for this particular class, especially for the captain specialization, is? Mm. Captain Harlock. <laughs> I can see that. Okay, I can see that. Oh, I mean, I could go with Malcolm Reynolds as well, but um, I wouldn't exactly say that Malcolm Reynolds has that has ca has captain level loyalties in that regard. True. Especially since the sole reason somebody like J somebody with somebody like Jane, the sole the sole reason he's there is because is because he made a better offer. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when it let me um let me compare let me compare the starting credits with the le with the naturalist. Mm hmm. So give me a moment to scroll back up to that. Okay. The naturalist only started with forty-six <laughs> times a thousand. Um, yeah. Start um, credits, which I think is fairly standard across the board. Yeah, we've mostly seen fours, from what I remember. But given that one of the effects allows them to throw money at the enemy to try and get them to not hit you, them starting with a bigger purse certainly makes sense, especially given some of the specializations. Yeah. Oh. That being that being said, I'd say this is I'd say this is a very I'd say this is a very good representation of the diplomancer class with al with also a few elements of the warlord in a sense. Mhm. Mm so, while the, while it certainly has the diplomancer aspect, I think somebody who knows what they're doing could easily play this as the frontline general kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. There'd be plenty of ways to do it too, mm -hmm. especially with the manipulative tactics. Yeah, which I will admit that when I was going through the manipulative tactics, I was reminded of the fighter in H and H. Well, you know, looks like they know how to f have fun with a uh, battlefield frontline commander as well. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm glad to. I'm glad to see that aspect. Um, showing up more and more because it definitely scratches a certain itch. Mm -hmm. The idea of you, the idea of using your party members as your, as your, as part of your arsenal, is something that's been dipped into in the past. But everybody's kind of gotten cold feet about it on sometimes on the grounds of it's taking control away from the players from other players by doing that, which mm -hmm. is about as dumb as that whole. What if I don't want to follow the Warlord's orders? <laughs> well, then the Warlord will kill you. Have fun. My response has always been, the Warlord is giving you free is giving you free attacks, movement, or bonuses. Why would you not want to? Mm -hmm. Especially sent in the case of something like Sprint, that's a really good way to get so to get somebody. To get people to um to get it to get in close, and mm -hmm. I'd imagine that you could have an interesting combination with a negotiator on the same party as a field knight. Not field knight, a um, yeah, field knight. What am I talking about? Because you know, mm. if they if they have if they're going to be doing the whole sprinting thing, well. If there's one thing the field knight is really good at, it's hauling ass. Yep. They got the rockets to prove it. 
So many rockets. So, so many rockets. As, about as many rockets to say that they, to say that, they're, that they probably played way too much Doom. That's a lie. There's no such thing as too much Doom. Exactly. Well, except for TNT Evolution, but nobody likes TNT. We don't talk about that. Why'd you bring that up? Because it's important to keep perspective. This is true. And I'm just, I'm sure I'm sure that there are some defenders somewhere, but <laughs> I'll be I'll be honest. I I haven't touched TNT Evolution in years because every time I try it, it puts me to sleep. Yeah. All right. I, valid. 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 Very valid. Mm -hmm. And now when it now next week we'll be continuing our non casting look. In fact in fact I'd say I'd say we only really have one caster left and it's the big one. That one the might big, actually big one. that one might actually have to be a two parter. Hopefully not. Just in case. But next time around we are tackling the smuggler. So just remember Han shot first. Never tell us the odds. <laughs> Which, incidentally, there's a there's a nice little beer and pretzels game called Never Tell Me the Odds, where di instead of dice resolution, it has a coin flip. Which is awesome. I think the game's only like four pages long. Like I said, it's a beer and pretzels. Beer game. and pretzels. <laughs> oh. And of co of course the. There's gonna be there's plenty of other um and there's plenty of other ent examples you could use with the sm with the smuggler. It's basically our space rogue. Um, yep. I'm not gonna be using Star Lord in any of my jokes because that's way too easy. And also, and also I'm go ahead. <laughs> also, um, I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to say anything nice about Artesian Builds as CEO. <laughs> But that will do it for the for this particular entry of Valley of the Judge. This was certainly a shorter one for once. Um, I mean, it, the early uh, melee classes or non-caster classes were uh, were shorter too. Yeah, it's only when we get into the casters where things get long. Because yeah, each one has a spell list. Mm -hmm. well, the next one has. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be fun. Mm -hmm. But I, as always, a sincere thanks to everyone for taking the time to come onto the sh come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>